Okay. All right. Thank you for joining us. This will also be on YouTube, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. And okay. All right, here we go with some great words from Mata Amrita Nandamai. And she says, how easily nature overcomes every obstacle. The tiny ant walks over the stone. The roots of the tree embrace the rocks in the soil. The river flows around every log and boulder in its way. Like nature, we should adapt to life circumstances, overcoming them with patience and enthusiasm. All right. I hope you like that. Good advice. All right. So I will go to the next slide. And so this will be the last lecture for module four. Uh, Mexico, no, sorry, Native Peoples, Mexico and Manifest Destiny. Sorry, let me go back there. Um, and I probably will not get finished with this, with all the slides today in this session. And if not, I will record uh, the leftover slides and put those on YouTube alongside this one. Okay. So no worries, you will be covered, all right? All right, so I wanted to show this map of the U.S.-Mexican War. Again, major battles. Uh, it may be a little bit hard to see depending on the size of your screen, but you probably can find uh, a map uh, of your, uh, an, an alternate map uh, you definitely can. But important to remember that this war took place two years, 1846 to 1848, before the U.S. Civil War, quite a number of years before the U.S. Civil War. But there was a, a number of major relationships between this war and the U.S. Civil War and Manifest Destiny and the U.S. Civil War. And Amy Greenberg discusses quite a bit of that in her chapter. I will address some of those points in today's lecture. Okay? Go to the next slide. So some main topics for today. One of these will be the U.S. racist problem with Manifest Destiny. There, of course, was a huge desire to obtain huge portions of land, but that desire for land was not always matched by wanting the people who were already there, the indigenous people and Mexican people. And so I will also, I'll say some things in, a, in addition to talking about Amy Greenberg's article some more. I will also have a few points about the primary sources by John O'Sullivan and Lansford Hastings. And from the point of view of many Mexican people in the United States, the aftermath of the U.S.-Mexican War boils down to the statement, we did not cross the border, the border crossed us. That's a well-known statement, a well-known alternative statement, uh, 
an alternative to the dominant U.S. view of the U.S.-Mexican War. So we'll talk about that some today also. Next slide. Okay, primary source, John O'Sullivan. There's a, an image of him on the left-hand side there. All right, so his article, Annexation, which we asked you to read. And of course, he was very much in favor of the annexation of Texas, the Mexican War. John O'Sullivan, he is credited with being the first person to publish a piece that used the phrase manifest destiny, implying that it was obvious, that it was a God-given uh, fate that the United States would expand as it did. So this was not a new idea, of course. It had roots in American exceptionalism, as we've discussed. But putting this label on it, calling it Manifest Destiny, along with other circumstances at the time, Mr. O'Sullivan was very much in the right place at the right time for these words, Manifest Destiny, to make the huge impact that they did and would make for decades to come. So the expansionists embraced John O'Sullivan's perspective on all this. There were uh, the forerunner, one of the forerunners of O'Sullivan's ideas, John Winthrop's metaphor of Massachusetts being a city on a hill. So the religious aspects of Manifest Destiny had some connection there. Okay, I think go to the next slide now. Okay. I've shown this image before, but it's a nice reminder of how things looked in much of North America and some of Central America before the U.S.-Mexican War. So as you can see, uh, the United States had expanded quite a bit, but Mexico was almost as large. Oh, sorry, that, sorry about that. Um, this, uh, this slideshow may have some old timings on it and kind of jumped ahead on us a little bit there. Anyway, yeah, that map says a lot. Things changed quite a bit. Um, okay, I'm seeing a, a hand raised here. Um, does anyone have a, a, a question? Oh, let me see here. Can you tell us what year that map is from? I will do so. Um, and, uh, but I'll need to do that after the slideshow. It's a great question. Okay. Uh, but I will do so. Thanks for that. All right. So, John O'Sullivan, well, uh, he had his point of view and he expressed it forcefully in his writing. He saw Mexico as being at fault in the dispute over Texas. He saw the Anglo settlers in, in Texas as being victims of the Mexican government. So you'll see some of that in pages 129 to 130 in the primary source. And the subject of slavery, you may remember some of the things that Ulysses S. Grant stated about the connection of slavery to the annexation of Texas. And he saw nothing but a connection there, right? Uh, O'Sullivan denied that. 
the exact opposite of what U.S. Grant said. He denied any relation between slavery, the expansion of slavery, and the need for the United States to annex Texas, or what he saw as the need for, for the U.S. to annex Texas. Also in this uh, primary source, he had some things to say about black people. He, he did see them as inferior to whites. Uh, so this would certainly gives, gives some, a very strong indication of John O'Sullivan's uh, thoughts about slavery. He was uh, concerned that it would be a bad idea for the United States to end slavery. He saw it as an institution that could be improved, that could be made more humane. In other words, he called for the melioration of slavery, wanted people to meliorate it. So that view was out there. O'Sullivan was uh, an influential exponent of that view. But there you have it. Uh, a very influential proponent of the annexation of Texas and forever an influence by publishing that term, Manifest Destiny. Let's go to the next slide. All right. <clears throat> now I'll spend a few minutes saying a few things about Lansford W. Hastings and his primary source we asked you to read some of. And this source, the title of that, The Emigrant's Guide to Oregon and California. So on the left-hand side there, you see a very, very, very old and deteriorated, ragged, probably first edition of that publication. And then in the middle there, a little bit later, and on the right, later still. Please keep in mind, this was a big bestseller. Hastings found a big, enthusiastic audience for this book, okay? So he went to Oregon and California, uh, was one of the earlier folks to do this, and he, and he was uh, all about encouraging people like him to go there and, and settle what he saw as unsettled territory. We'll go to the next slide. All right, there he is on the far right there, Lansford W. Hastings. He was born in Ohio, Mount Vernon, in 1819. And he was a lawyer by occupation. And on the side, he uh, did a little adventuring. So he found a lot of that way out west. 1842, he reached the Oregon Territory, so he is far from home. And then he went on to California. And remember, uh, California then, part of Mexico. And I believe Oregon was still part of uh, the, the British, still had uh, holdings there, okay? They wouldn't hang on to it much longer, okay? And then a few years later, 1845, back home in Ohio, Hastings published The Emigrant's Guide. And as I said, lots of people enjoyed it, used it, bought it, etc. And so uh, people are still reading it, parts of it, in courses like this one. Okay, next slide. So he had some, some unfavorable, unfavorable things to say about Mexican people in his Emigrant's Guide. 
And so he saw the character of Mexican people as being dominated by very negative traits. He listed ignorance. He listed superstition, suspicion, superciliousness. All right. So not silly, but when you're supercilious, that means you look down on other people. Okay. So here is Hastings definitely looking down on Mexican people and charging Mexican people with looking down on others. So for Hastings, these bad traits were built into the Mexican character. So, so very very prejudiced. We'll go to the next slide. Continuing with some points from that primary source. So keep in mind, you know, as I've said, this is a bestseller. So it, it indicates that, you know, uh, the audience for Mr. Hastings would be an audience that was congenial to Manifest Destiny, supportive of the war in Mexico. He compared the higher order of the Mexicans to the low, lower order of our citizens, meaning white Anglo citizens. So he did admit uh, that there were some people, some Mexican people he, he saw as good, but they were only as good as the worst white people. Hastings said that, wrote that. And he also, when he compared Mexican people to native peoples, he saw both of them as very much lacking civilization. Describe them as barbarous, without bad morals, immoral, and unintelligent. So uh, he didn't sugarcoat his his views, and he presented them as uh, indisputable. So. This was part of his guide to Oregon and California, not just the territory, but a guide to many of the people who were already there. So, of course, with these kind of statements, if people believed, as Hastings did, that most of the people out there already were bad people, then they certainly didn't deserve to hang on to that territory. We'll go to the next slide. All right. Well, this image here, a uh, map of a region uh, in northern Utah there. And you see, I uh, hope you can see part of Idaho up, up above and part of Wyoming, very small part of Nevada on the left. This has to do with something called the Hastings Cutoff. This was a, a shortcut named after Lansford Hastings. He, he discovered it, and he encouraged other people to take it to get to California quicker. This was a very, very bad idea of Lansford Hastings. Some people took him on his word, paid very big money uh, for information and guidance, and they paid for it dearly. So uh, what happened was that the, the shortcut ended up taking much, much, much longer uh, than it was uh, supposed to take. People went through terrible hardships. They got to California uh, not at the time when they wanted to, and they 
got there exactly when uh, a huge blizzard hit the Sierra Nevada mountains. This led to starvation among some of the settlers and cannibalism among some of the settlers. So the Hastings cutoff led to terrible tragedy. We'll go to the next slide. All right, so more about Hastings. 1846, you had the Hastings cutoff fiasco, and this was the Donner Party, this group of settlers, and they went through all sorts of tragedies on the way to their destination, and things got even worse after they arrived. And by 1849, though, Hastings was back in California. He was not held accountable for uh, misleading these people. He continued to practice law, and as some in the field of law do, he went on to enter politics. And given some of the record of Lansford W. Hastings, this uh, not necessarily a good thing, we'd have to say. During the U.S. Civil War, it will probably come as no surprise that Lansford Hastings was a supporter of the Confederacy. And after the Civil War, he continued his adventuring and he went outside the United States to Brazil. And he published a guide for people who were interested in settling in that country. By 1870, his life had come to an end. Hastings was on his way back to Brazil and he, he died at that point. So uh, this was a man who, he may not come up in a lot of uh, overviews of Manifest Destiny or US history, but he did, he did make quite a, a splash, you might say, and uh, not necessarily a nice one, especially from the Donner's, Donner Party's point of view and from the point of view of the Mexican people and the indigenous people in California. We'll go to the next slide. All right, so let me uh, change the subject a bit here. And this is an image of connected with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which was signed at the finish of the U.S. war with Mexico. You see, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm uh, sorry for that distraction there. Yeah, I, uh, there were some previous timings on this, and it's kind of getting ahead of me a little bit. So my bad. But you see a document there in Spanish and a medallion that uh, I believe belonged to one of the signers. Okay. So this is from the library, U.S. Library of Congress. All right. So let's uh, consider some of the situations at the end of the Mexican-American War and drawing from the chapter by Amy Greenberg, she provides some, some excellent um, summing up of, of this time. All right, so on page 25, I give you a quote. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, it made some promises. And there would be many, many Mexican people in the United States now, in territory that was that belonged to the United States after this treaty. And so the treaty promised those Mexican people who were in the uh, territory ceded to the United States, they would have full citizenship rights after the war. This was a promise that was not always kept. So, for example, uh, 
yeah, what would how would the uh, the the land of individual Mexican people be handled? Uh, what would be the status of the Spanish language and people who spoke Spanish? What would they do? Would they uh, would they be permitted to continue conducting their affairs in Spanish? More often than not, no. We'll go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, another uh, map here. Okay, so this covers quite a few, covers from 1836 to 1845. So you see here in the Republic of Texas uh, was annexed in 1845. We've talked about that some. Uh, a disputed area around in here, 1836 to 1845. So this was claimed uh, by the U.S. in 1845 to 1848 and eventually obtained by the U.S. And of course, this darker shaded area, a little darker, the Mexican session of 1848. And down here, this narrow and darkest area, the, the Gadsden Purchase, of 1853, so uh, lower part of Arizona here, uh, some of what is now New Mexico, okay? Let's go to the next slide. All right, so some points from pages 34, page 37 in Greenberg. I have mentioned this before, but uh, I want to reinforce it. So during the U.S. Civil War, Manifest Destiny was, was paused, right? Um, the United States itself was up for grabs, right? The Union was imperiled. So the expansionist aims of the federal government had to be put aside for the dispute, the conflict with the South and the states that had seceded. But of course, Manifest Destiny came back strong after the Civil War. Sorry about that. And a very uh, uh, effective quote by Greenberg on page 36, this rebirth of expansionism was made possible by an important shift in ideas of empire and citizenship in the United States. So there was this change, right? Uh, early in the 1800s, people in the United States didn't think the same way in general about empire and citizenship as they did after the Civil War, okay? <clears throat> so, a lot of changes in the 1800s. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here's an image that speaks to this idea of the border crossed us, the people of Mexico. And this is from 2020. It's from Hollywood, Florida. It's from an art exhibit. And you see there uh, an image of that, I presume, you know, takes place on the southwestern border. You have a person helping an undocumented immigrant crossing, helping this person with a drink of water from a bottle. Uh, it's nine o'clock. Yes, it is. Yep, there's my there's my little reminder on my computer. Nice voice, huh? And uh, this person has a halo, so you know, performing altruistic deeds, angelic deeds. You see a skull in the background. You see a cactus. You see the golden arches of McDonald's in the background. The border crossed us. Okay. We'll go to the next slide. 
All right. So, with pages 31 to 37 oh, so of the way, Greenberg chapter. And the hold, idea. Hold on a second. Yeah, see, there's some old recordings on that. Let me, um, I got to fix something for a minute here. Hang on just a second. My bad. Of wanting land, but not the people with roots in the land. <sighs> so. Let me get that off. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for your patience with that bad screw up. Um, and let me. Okay, I've got my microphone. Is it on now? Okay, thanks, folks. Ah, oh, my bad. Okay. Before the U.S. Civil War, as you can see, uh, whenever the United States would expand in these new territories, there was a promise of full political rights for the newly incorporated Americans. And this was... This was promised to extend to native peoples and Mexicans. This promise was not kept. As Greenberg shows us in the chapter, white Americans abandoned this principle of full political rights for non-whites at home and abroad. So the legacy of this broken promise uh, tragically, it, it still affects things and people today. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, here's an image from uh, Battle 1847 from the U.S.-Mexican War. I think it's safe to say it's cleaned up quite a bit, uh, hardly a bloody depiction but the Battle of Veracruz, bombardment, March 25th, 1847. And I found this image on National Park Service website, and uh, this was from a site that uh, discusses women's roles in the Mexican, in the U.S. war with Mexico. And women on both sides helped out soldiers from both sides. So they were there to alleviate suffering, regardless of, of who was doing the suffering. We'll go to the next slide. Let's look at the Trio of Guadalupe Hidalgo in some more depth. And this was signed in 1848. So Mexico gave up about half of its land to the United States, including, of course, California. New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, parts of Colorado and Wyoming. Mexico also recognized the Rio Grande River as the southwestern border with the U.S. And again, if you were a Mexican citizen in that territory that was given over to the United States, the United States promised you future U.S. citizenship. Okay. And the next slide. Some more points about this very important treaty. 
from 1848. All right, so one thing that the United States agreed to was to take on some of the debt that Mexican people had accumulated, $3.35 million worth of debts. It's a lot of money anytime, but way back then, uh, that's something you can Google and see how much that's worth in 2023 dollars. The United States also paid Mexico $15 million for the loss of its land. So more than the Louisiana Purchase, okay? And also uh, looking at the conflicts between native peoples and Mexican peoples. The United States promised to guard the residents of the Mexican session from raids by native peoples. Uh, not, not entirely sure about this, but um, this was another one of those promises that was hard to keep and probably was not always kept in, in every instance. You know how it is, there can be things on paper and real life is always a lot more complicated and sometimes it doesn't work out that way for various reasons. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, here's the Battle of Monterey, kind of a similar image. And this one's a little bit, I'd call this one a little bit more realistic than the previous one. You can see more of the suffering that was involved. Uh, you see the US troops on the left, and you can see Mexican troops more in the center there, sort of in the background, and you see some of them holding crosses above their heads, okay? At the Battle of Monterey, this was also uh, a, uh, an engagement in which uh, Mexican women and some American women uh, really performed a lot of sacrifice to help the wounded men of both sides. And they were honored for that by both sides. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Getting a little bit close here, I'll probably have to uh, find a, a comfortable stopping point. But yeah, there'll be just a few slides left over that I'll put on YouTube. Okay, the aftermath of the Mexican-US war, and let's remember that we're still in the aftermath of that. Um, the effects of that war continue to have an impact on relationships between the governments of these countries and between many of the people of these two nations. Some Americans argued that the United States was in a position in which it could have and should have gone ahead and taken all of Mexico. Uh, this, this didn't come to pass, obviously. Southerners were some of those who opposed this idea. And uh, it, it may have to do with uh, the long opposition to slavery in Mexico and also the Catholicism in Mexico. Um, as I've said before, anti-Catholic sentiment uh, was widespread in the United States at one time, but uh, the South has a particular hostility to, to Catholicism. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Some more about this aftermath, uh, about attitudes of Southerners. They wanted annexation of more slave territory, but they did not want Mexico's large mestizo population. Okay, so racism came into the picture. So the mestizo people, 
uh, population of mixed indigenous and European ancestry, okay? And yes, others wanted to keep Roman Catholics out of the United States as much as possible. Uh, these were people who, yeah, they, they just didn't, new, new territory was one thing, but if it had a large mixed race population, large Catholic population, which it would have if the United States would have taken all of Mexico, there are a lot of people who didn't want that in the United States, okay? So a uh, lot of factors at play here. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, I here is, uh, I'm gonna kind of shift gears a little bit and let's see what time I've got. Um, I'll say a little bit more, we're at 9-11 now, okay. Um, I want to share some information from this scholar, Fawn Amber Montoya, a PhD uh, historian, professor at Col State, Colorado State University at Pueblo. And uh, she gives some, some focused accounts of the impact of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in certain regions. So let me share that with you because um, it's really hard to explain the entire impact of that treaty, but it, it is uh, perhaps more helpful to, to narrow our focus a little bit, all right? So the signing of that treaty was very complex and Fawn Amber Montoya stated that for those people who are living in Southern Colorado, for example, the treaty really forces people in that area to, it forced them to solidify what their nationality was. From 1821 to 1848, there had been some disputes about it. Before 1821, people in that region had been Spanish. Then after 1821, they are technically Mexican, whether they felt affiliated with Mexico or not. But by 1848, they had to decide, are you a US citizen or are you a Mexican citizen? But there's not really spaces for them to be US citizens. So this captures some of the variabilities in uh, the nationality of the folks who live there in these disputed regions torn up by war, okay? And I think, I think, yeah, I will stop there. Don't have too much time. Uh, and I'll cover a little bit more of what Fawn Amber Montoya says about this situation in the leftover slides and I'll put that on YouTube also, okay? All right. So uh, if you have questions, please, let's see, put them in the chat for me or email them to me and I will do my best to answer those for you. All right. So thank you so much for being a great audience again. I hope this has helped you with the reading. We'll start a new module uh, on Friday dealing with social movements in the United States. I also need to tell you that the next assignment, which will be uh, one of those short ID writing assignments and some objective questions. So part of it will be in discussion section and part of it will be online. This is scheduled for Friday, April 28th, okay? Friday, April 28th, all right? So there'll be some, um, there'll be a handout coming along for that and your discussion teachers and I 
will give you some more uh, tips for studying about that next assignment, okay? Thank you all so much. Have a beautiful day out there in Lawrence. I miss you and look forward to talking to you again virtually. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, Atik, I see that you have a question. Could you, uh, I don't mean to be dismissive or rude or anything, but uh, I probably better take it offline. So if you could email it to me uh, or we could have a Zoom meeting or uh, I'm willing to do Zoom office hours this afternoon, okay? So, uh, so please send that to me, okay? Thanks everybody, take care of yourselves. Have a great day, bye-bye.